How's it going, everybody? Uh, thank you so much for jumping in on this episode of the Stupid Pe- Questions podcast. Um, today we have Scott Tinley coming in, who is a world champion in the world of triathlon, sits in the um, Hall of Fame for um, the triathlon world, and was really around when the sport started to really gain ground. He is the champion from 1982, and I think he had another gold championship in 1984. Uh, Five, I believe, don't quote me on that, um, and had many, many years of experience, did over 400 triathlons, winning over close to 100 of them. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, obviously his triathlon career, a little bit about the books that he's written that have to do with not only um, the sport itself, but transitioning out of it and retiring, and also um, a book that is called The Wake of Our Past that deals with the work of a historical fiction that focuses on returning Vietnam War veteran um, and many other things. So, I hope you guys enjoy this episode of the Stupid Questions podcast. And without further ado, Scott Tinley. But yeah, again, Scott, just thank you. Wanted to thank you so much for coming on and uh, being able to talk a little bit about your experiences and who you are. And to get started, um, I'd love to just hear from your perspective because we are just meeting for the first time. Who is Scott Tinley? Like from a young age to who he is today, what was that journey like? How did you get to where you are? Wow. Start out with a big one, huh? Yeah. To be honest with you, Seth, I have, I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, I could chron- chronicle it. I could, you know, spend weeks, months, years, you know, sort of going, going down that road backwards and trying to figure out, you know, what decisions I made, both good and bad, mm-hmm. that led me to where I am now. But, um, you know, I'm still pretty forward thinking. So, sure. um, yeah, you know, I mean, we all make decisions based upon what we think is the best for us or the people around us that we care about at any given point in time. And, um, you know, I mean, I've made some good ones and I made some poor ones. And, um, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm wrestling with the results. For the most part, uh, I'm, I'm pretty fucking happy. Yeah. <laughs> you good go. deal. Yeah, that's awesome. So where did you grow up? Uh, I grew up in Orange County. Sort of South LA. Uh, my family's been in Southern California since uh, I don't know the late 19th century. My okay. great 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 grandfather was a mayor of Los Angeles during the Civil War, only okay. because, only because he spoke four languages. Wow. Um, but yeah, we've uh, we you know we've been SoCal beach rats um, for a yeah. long long time. So did you grow up, uh, I'm assuming, surfing and doing a lot of the outdoor sports? Surfing was a big one for me. Um, A lot of beach activities. um, And, of of course, Southern California during the late 50s, early 60s was much different Mm -hmm. than it is now. Sure. Um, It is, uh, it was uh, a fairly idyllic place. It was affordable. It was fun. It was relatively safe. And, uh, you know, great parents, big family, you know, eight kids. Wow. Um, so a lot of siblings always around. Um, so yeah, we, uh, we, we had a lot of fun growing up. A lot yeah. Fun. What, where are you in the lineup of the siblings, the eight siblings? Uh, I'm the second oldest, oldest boy. So, you know, uh, a bit of responsibility, some of which sure. I shirked. Some of yeah. which I, you know, I took on. <laughs> uh, I have an older sister who's kind of been a rock for you know the rest of us kids. Mm. We lost our dad uh, when I was pretty young, so you know we we wrestled with, uh, you know, just how to get by. Yeah, you know, we, we were not wealthy by any means, and sure, uh, but you know, we, we had we had a lot of a lot of, uh, like I said, a lot of good times, a lot of a lot of struggles, but for the most part. Everything worked out in the end. Sure. If I may pry a little bit. I'd, or so is when, working out, I, I should say. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, I might have pry a little bit. So when I was 16, I actually lost my father. Um, and I know of the damages, long-term advantages that it has created in my life. But I'd be curious if you're comfortable with it, just unpacking a little bit of, you don't have to get into excruciating detail, but kind of what yeah, happened and like yeah, how yeah, that it's... affected you through life. 
Well, you know, you know, I, I've written about it. It's public. Uh, it's not a big thing. I'm, you know, I'm happy to explore that. Sure. Um, I do think that that you know, being in that tumultuous time, and again, you know, Seth, you can relate to this. You know, having lost your own father in that same time frame, it's it's a really crappy time to to lose a parent, particularly, you know, a young male losing a father figure. Yeah. How because you really you? don't know who you are, what's going on, and and uh, uh, you know who you are, which you want to be, you know, what kind of responsibilities you need to take on, how much you can mm-hmm. still sort of hide under the, you know, the the cloak and daggerness of 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 being an early teen. Yeah. But I think ultimately what it did for me is it, it informed and molded the kind of occupations that I took on. Mm. You know, I mean, every job that I've had. And, and I didn't really realize this until you know, one, of, one of my friends um, pointed out at one point, he goes, he goes, dude, you, you've, you've been running away from death in every job you've had since you were 15. Mm. What? What are you talking about? <laughs> so, you know, you look at that, you know, lifeguard, paramedic, firefighter, professional athlete. Yeah. You know, college teacher, you know, everything that I've done is is sort of like, you know, chasing this eternal youth. Mm. You know, and, and part of that was family and you know, losing my dad early. And part of it was living in Southern California. And part of it was just you know, that's, that's who I was. And those are the type of jobs um, that, that I enjoyed and I could yeah. do well because I found pleasure, pleasure in them. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that's does that deep. make sense? Does that connect with you at all? Yeah, it does. Um, I mean, so I'm, a, I'm still, it's crazy. I'm coming up on, uh, I think I'll be this next year alive longer without my dad than I was with my dad. That was something I was just talking to my wife about here recently. I'll be 31 um, in September and then October will be kind of that turning point. So for me, yeah, it's been, I I mean, I ran from a lot of things for a long time, death probably being one of them. um, But I haven't really, I've never really been truly afraid of it. I've always wanted to figure out how to make what I've experienced become some sort of an advantage um, yeah. as strange as that may sound, um, there's still days I'm sure that even you still have where you're like, Oh man, I wish my father was here to kind of witness that or experience that as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's created a, I mean, a definite path for me in life that had I not gone through that experience, I don't think I'd be even half the person I am today. So in a lot of ways I owe a lot to that experience that I have had, right. um, for sure. But so for me, and I'd be curious to hear how your experience has been. Um, after I lost my father, I was really fortunate to have a lot of really good role models, male and female, but predominantly male, because that was the vacuum in my life who were kind of helped me to become who I am today. Um, I still hold some of my father's attributes, obviously, but a lot of who I am as a man has come from other men who I've kind of looked up to. So do you have a a, a category or a um a folder of people kind of in your mind or or men that kind of really set you up to be the man you are today and kind of help you grow through those things i i I do seth but the list is very short um i i was always very selective about sure my heroes and in some ways perhaps too critical of them because everyone had to i don't know if you had to go through the same thing but they had to measure up to what what I thought my father was mm. going to be to me, you know, in my late teens, early twenties, you know, as I got married, as I had kids, and now I have grandkids. And so, you know, I've been pretty selective about, you know, uh, particularly those, those male figures who have influenced me. Yeah. But, but yeah, I've had, I've had a couple that have had profound effects. Um, unfortunately, most of them have also passed at this point, you know, because, you know, they were older and mm-hmm. I'm older and, you know, these guys didn't make it into their eighties or their nineties because they were, they were hard living people. Sure. You know, I mean, one of them was, uh, a, an early Navy SEAL, um, you know, a restaurateur age group winner mm-hmm. in the Ironman, you know, big wave surfer, stuff like that. So, uh, you know, th- those, those sort of early childhood and, and early adulthood experiences perhaps um, 
affected their their chances of of, of living a long <laughs> and healthful life, you know, well past the you know the seventies and eighties. So. Yeah, I want to dig into that a little bit more, if that's okay. Uh, maybe touching on each of them just briefly. But is there something about the Navy SEAL guy? that you latched onto and that you wanted to be like, or was it something that he more of came to you and showed interest? And so you were receptive of kind of that mentorship. I, I think there's a little bit of both. Um, yeah. You know, sometimes you, you test people or you, you know, you reach out to them, you spend time with them, you know, either professionally or socially. And, and, and if there isn't any sort of reciprocity, you know, if they kind of push you away or they don't really let you into their life, then, you know, you just sort of chalk it up as, all right, well, that didn't work out. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I mean, this individual in particular, uh, you know, was always receptive, you know, to me and my wife and my kids, you know, not only as a, as a fellow competitor, but, um, you know, as a mentor of sorts, e even though, mm -hmm. you know, there was never that, um, you know, that designation of roles. Yeah. I mean, he, he never would have you even, you know, gone to that term mentor. <laughs> Anyways, yeah. So, yeah. um, you, you know that, how that works. It's, uh, you, you gotta be careful picking your heroes. Yeah? Sure. Because sometimes you pick the wrong ones and they fail you. Hmm. Did you ever pick a wrong one? Yes. Several times. And they failed me. And so, uh, you know, and I just chalked that up as experience. Yeah. Do you, would you mind sharing one of those stories? Um, like, you know what, I'd probably rather not go into that just cause it's kind of a negative thing. And I figured sure. it's sort of water under the bridge and, uh, sure. uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very interested in the, uh, the concept and the notion of, of heroes, particularly sports heroes, cause it's something, um, that, you know, I teach in my, in my sport humanities courses. Mm -hmm. And my students in particular are also, you know, interested in uh, um, this idea um, that we find our heroes in different sectors today than we did in previous generations. You know, we used to find them military heroes. You know, mm -hmm. who was the last Patton, right? Westmoreland. Yeah. Uh, we find them in, in religious figures, Martin Luther King, Gandhi. Right. Mm -hmm. Politicians, you know, who's the last political hero, you know, that crossed the party lines? I mean, was it JFK? Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Science heroes, you know, medical heroes, you know, mm -hmm. Einstein. Yeah. And and it seems now we, we find them in popular culture. You know, we, we latch on to people like the Kardashians. Yeah. <laughs> OJ Simpson. It's like, yeah. Oh, yeah, they're famous for being famous. Yeah. But, it's, you know, you, you know, they are. They are purposely self-creating an aura with the use of social media and, and other mm -hmm. you know types of media sources, and uh, you know, I mean, and, and, and millions and millions are fooled. We mm -hmm. allow ourselves to be fooled. Yeah, it's interesting with the yeah, generation I mean, of. A lot, sorry. Go for it. I was going to say a, a lot of my students were, were completely distraught. When Lance Armstrong you know, went on Oprah and admitted to doping, you know, for seven Tour de France. Yeah. And, you know, and, you know, full disclosure, I've known Lance since he was 15. You know, I yeah. have no problems with Lance. You know, I get along with him fine. Um, but, but you know, my students who, who, who were, who had, you know, believed everything in Lance, you know, we, I had asked them, were you really, you know, thinking that, you know, that he was the second coming or was there some sort of human frailty in yourself that you were projecting, projecting onto what Lance symbolized for you? And, um, you know, sometimes they were, they're a little put off by, by that suggestion. Hmm. Um, but anyway, it's, it's a fascinating subject and, uh, um, it sports is. heroes, gosh, you know, it, it's risky. Yeah, no, it is risky. And, and I come from a, um, a pretty religious background and I've seen it time and time again where there's like a religious leader within our small circle or a larger circle within our church. And then a lot of my friends, not a lot, but a significant amount of my friends will follow a certain person 
as like a role model. And then when that person falters, it's like a lot of the foundational beliefs or whatever that they were holding, they sort of realized wasn't even truly theirs because when that person falters, their, their bedrock kind of crumbles. And so I've kind of adopted this idea. I don't even remember where I heard it, but it's the idea of um, letting others be a witness for right and wrong rather than the standard of them. Cause as soon as we set our standard on any type of yeah. worldly hero, like it becomes pretty quickly. As soon as that person falls, it's like, Oh man, what was I truly believing in? It's not solid. Yeah. And yeah, going well, just briefly, overused, go for it. it it's an overused uh, modifier, mm-hmm. right? Someone says, Oh, you're so heroic. Well, what does that mean? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, the, uh, the, the ancient definition may be, you know, anybody putting themselves in harm's way in the everyday course of life in an effort to assist somebody in need, sure. which means that any one of us could be heroic. Yeah. You know, we walk down the street and there's a burning building and we run in and, you know, pull a baby out of a crib. Crib. Yeah. I mean, you don't, you don't have to be a superstar. Yeah. You, know, you don't have to be in the NBA or Major League Baseball, NFL. You can be heroic. Yeah. So sure. anyways, it's, um, it's it's a good topic, and, uh, and I'm glad you brought it up. And hope, hopefully, some of your listeners, you know, would would think about why they choose to be influenced by some people and and not others. So. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it's something we should think about more. It's interesting that you were talking a little bit about the social media generation and you know the Kardashians and whoever now who they've kind of become famous. And I think it has a lot to do with it's. it's with the tools that we have at our disposal now for the internet, um, it's really about who can be the most prideful in the most attractive way. And that's what seems to kind of go out there, like talk about who I am, what I've done and what I'm doing. And it, and it like casts a sense of on some people, like almost like a, oh, I, aspiration to a point of jealousy. And then we follow after that. It's really interesting. Yeah. That whole yeah. topic. Yeah. Um, so it's one a slippery other slippery slope and, and yeah, there's, there's no, there's no way to get beyond that. Right. Yeah. There's always going to be somebody greater and lesser than yourself. For sure. Yeah. It's a big world. So I'd love to hear, how did you get into triathlon for the first time? Cause really, I mean, you're in the triathlon hall of fame, I believe is what it's called. You were there like kind of at the grassroots movement when Kona really started to become a thing and then it was getting bigger and bigger and getting more media attention. How did you get into triathlon and then as it grew? Well, I happened to be fortunate um, to be living in Southern California, in San Diego, um, near Mission Bay, um, which is basically the birthplace of the sport. Right. You know, I mean, there, there perhaps were other events, uh, you know, that had three different sports around the planet in the past hundred years. But as a sustainable event um, with three sports, including swimming, biking and running, the origins really go back to 1974 in Mission Bay. And I happened to witness one in 1975 because it was down the street from my house as a college student. And a year later, you know, I said, Gosh, when's when's the next event like that? Hmm. And I think there's only one or two put on by the San Diego Track Club. Um, and I jumped in. I finished third overall. I had a blast. Yeah. And and I asked everybody, you know, in within earshot, hey, when's the next one of these? Go, we don't know. You know, it's uh, it's a pretty much unorganized group. Uh, there's no sanction sanctioning body. There's no rules there's no structure um it just kind of comes together organically um and, and the first one i did was like on a you know wednesday night after work at five o'clock in the summertime <laughs> oh wow <laughs> with 45 people and yeah. you know all right that's a blast but as all the stories go you know it just went from there sure john collins the founder of the iron man triathlon uh, was one of those people who had competed in those early events, 74, 75, 76. And when he was transferred to Honolulu, you know, as a Navy commander, um, he took the concept with him. So origins of the Iron Man, first That's one in wild. 1978 with 14 people, right? 
have their roots in San Diego. And I, again, as I said, I just happen to be fortunate enough to you know, have a little bit of skill in those three disciplines and right place, right time. You know, yeah. Just That's total amazing. Fortune. Yeah. Did, did you grow Kismet, up doing French call it. Yeah. Did you grow up doing any type of endurance sports at all before that? Not really. <laughs> I didn't swim very well. You know, I mean, I swam after my surfboard before they had surf leashes. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, I rode a bicycle uh, a lot because uh, you know I, I couldn't couldn't really afford a car till I was seventeen or eighteen, mm -hmm. and, um, and and I did run a little bit in high school. I joined the cross country team just because I I completely sucked at you know the stick and ball sports, and yeah. I, I couldn't do any, anything that re that required true coordination. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I had, I had a couple couple of good seasons on the on the track and cross country team. But, you know, nothing stellar, nothing worth scholarship. You know, I mean, my best mile as a junior in high school was 442. Wow. And, and you know, I mean, that, didn't, that doesn't get you very far. Sure. Yeah, that's super interesting. So I'm curious then in going into this sport kind of for the first time, I mean, you said your first triathlon was in 76. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So like six years later, you're world champion at the, at the Kona race. What was that journey like and like going from like, oh, this is a fun thing to, oh, I'm going to actually take this seriously. Like, how do you, how did you train for that? What was the nutrition like back then? Was there even any nutrition guideline? You kind of making it up as you go, training regiment, recovery days, training blocks. Like what, how did that all start to form? Because I assume you didn't come out the gate like, okay, I'm going to try to take down 160 gar grams of carbs an hour and, you know. Everything was experimentation. My, sure. my first Ironman in 1981, uh, I, I put my bike in the bike rack the night before the event. And it was a bike that I, I had bought uh, for $189. And I thought it was all that because it had 10 speeds. And it had center <laughs> pull brakes and gum wall tires. And I had a toolkit with vice grips, bailing wire, duct tape. I, I was ready for anything. You know, I had a tank top <laughs> to keep cool. And, you, you know, these, these little baggy shorts. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I looked at the bike next to me and this person had a big glass jar of peanut butter <laughs> wired to his handlebars. And, you know, you know it's like a half gallon vat of peanut butter. Oh, and he was going to open the lid during the bike ride and just put his fingers there. And, and I thought, this guy is brilliant because, you know, I don't know what I'm going to eat. I heard there's eight stations. <laughs> I might have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Oh People, my goodness! You know, had had bananas in their pockets, so, and that's just nutrition. We didn't know how to train. You know, we just more is better. So we overtrained for years and years, and then finally, eighty-two was a real tipping point because there was a little bit of science applied, and, and you know, there were exercise physiologists who were studying, hmm. you know, these crazy multi-sport people and coming back with a certain amount of data suggestions on how you might block things but you know no videotapes no coaches i you know i mean even now it's you know i've done 400 races i never had a coach <laughs> it's like who's gonna coach me right yeah how, how can you tell me what to do right i know my body i know what i want to do i know what what i did right and perhaps more importantly i know what i did wrong and so you know, nothing much has changed, really. Yeah. I'm still just out there kind of, you know, winging it, as they say. Yeah. So through your entire career, you never had a coach? Is that, did I understand that correctly? Never had a coach. Do you coach? I would or go to master swim programs. Okay. I'm sorry? Have you ever coached um, any athletes up to this point? I did it twice, and I, I don't think I was that good at it. Yeah. Were they professionals uh, or who were they? No, no, no. Uh, one of them was kind of a friend of a friend, good guy. He was an age grouper. Mm -hmm. And the other one was, um, uh, she won't mind me saying it, Alexandra Paul, who was um, an actress on the television series uh, Baywatch. Oh, cool. And she got into the Kona Ironman on a, kind of a celebrity ticket. No. And uh, she cold called me out of the blue and says, I need a coach. I said, well, I, I'm not really a coach. Um she goes, all right, well, 
I'm going to call up Dave Scott to go call up Dave, man. He's a great coach. That's what he does. And he's good at it. And then like an hour later, I go, you know, first of all, she's kind of cute. <laughs> and second of all, this could be really fun. So I called her back. I go, let me coach you. <laughs> nice. So I coached her and she finished the Ironman and, um, and that was it. You know, I mean, she sort of retired from triathlons after that, but <laughs> that's, awesome. that's the extent of my coaching experience. Yeah. Oh, that, no, that's awesome. So you said like uh, when the exercise physiologists first started getting involved that there was some data and science behind it. What kind of data and science were they pulling in? Was this like a heart rate? I mean, no, it wasn't lactate. Like what, what were they going after and cutting it starting to dissect? Yeah, we didn't really know much about lactate tolerances. Um, there was, you know, there was a little bit of zone training. Um, the early heart rate monitors were, of course, the size of a New York phone book. <laughs> and you know you strap into your handlebars or your bike and you're like oh, this is really working good you know and they were very unreliable <laughs> but a lot of it was about trying to determine um you know how much mileage within the three disciplines and and i, I spent a lot of time with uh you know with my uh competitor scott molina mm -hmm. um in 82 83 84 when he was living in san diego and at one point he said, look, you know, we don't really know how much to do, but I'm looking at what, you know, top Olympic swimmers do yardage wise, um, you know, what, what Tour de France cyclists would do and what Olympic marathoners would do. And I think I'm just going to do all three. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he would, uh, he would train 45, 50 hours a week. Oh my goodness. And I would, I would hang in there as, as much as I could with him chase them around the county you know we, i rolled down my driveway at eight in the morning and my neighbors would be going to work and then i'd come back on the bike you know about the same time they're coming back at five o'clock they just look at me like where you been i don't know 100 130 miles 150 miles oh my god i'm really sure and did, were you were during <laughs> not, these rides were you taking in there. Yeah, during these type of rides, were you taking in nutrition at all? Like at that point, was it peanut butter in a glass oh, jar or Seven Eleven? You know, Just, you yeah. stop and get a big bag of pork rind chips and a couple of cokes, and <laughs> oh yeah, this, this way well before Power Bar. Yeah, was Power Bar like yeah. the first? And, you know, it, yeah. Hats off to Power Bar. You know, Brian Maxwell and his and his wife Jenny were. You know, they really were seminal in, in introducing, you know, well-designed, accessible, affordable nutrition. I mean, they yeah. created a category. And, uh, yeah. you know, they, Brian, um, before he had the company, was just test marking things. He would send me these, these little foil wrappers in a cardboard box with instructions handwritten on like a cocktail napkin. You know, have two bikes at mile 16 of your 20-mile run. And, and I'd open up these little foil things and, and it, it looked like little pieces of, of, uh, of Moroccan hash. You know? <laughs> and, and, you know, and my friends would go, dude, where are you getting the hash? I go, it's not hash. It's power bar. And we could, and he goes, no, a little piece. You know? <laughs> that's how wow. power bar got started. <laughs> yeah, that's wild. So you're pretty good friends with him and his wife that started that? Well, yeah, unfortunately, Brian passed away when he was 51 oh, okay. um, after selling the company to Nestle mm -hmm. for something like $386 million. And he, uh, you know, very philanthropic man, helping out a lot of people. Good. Um, and uh, he had six kids and, you know, several of them were very young. And uh, the poor guy was standing in line at the post office and had a massive heart attack and died 51. Wow. So, yeah, that's tough. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Another, wow. another hero who failed me because he died before I could, you know, sort of get to know him a little better. I know, man, that's tough. Yeah. Heart attack stuff's no joke. Um, I'm assuming he was a triathlete or an athlete of some sort. Ryan was a runner. Okay. He was from Montreal. He was on the Canadian Olympic uh, marathon team in 76. Um, uh, when it was in Montreal and I think, I think his best marathon was like, uh, I don't know, two fourteen, two fifteen. you know, nothing world-class, but mm -hmm. uh, you know, enough to get him, get him on the Olympic team. 
and, you know, continued to love running for, you know, well into his, you know, forties. And, um, I, you know, fate got him. Yeah. Too young. Yeah. So I want to go to 1982, um, the world championship win in Kona for the first time. So I was just actually watching some of the old broadcasts yesterday and the day before of just some of the coverage that ABC was doing. Um, and they were covering you and you were, I believe you were in second or third coming off the bike. And then you had six miles to catch first place when you're coming up on to that pass at six miles and then carrying on forward. Take us through like what that felt like. Maybe if you can remember what was going through your mind at that time and then all the way to the finish line. Like what was that experience like? Well, so if you recall, the, the Ironman had two events in 82, right? They had the, the February event, which I won, uh, passing Dave Scott um, pretty early in the run. Um, and, and then they had – another event in October of 82 because the race director and owner of the event at the time, Valerie Silk wanted to uh, give the opportunity for athletes from colder climes, European areas to mm -hmm. train throughout the summer. But February was, February was a big thing for me because, you know, I was working full time. Um, I, I, I was married. I had a house payment and, there were no real professional opportunities in the sport. You know, I mean, I, you know, I might've had a sponsor, but sure. you know, they would give me you know, like 10% off of a bike tire. <laughs> it's not exactly <laughs> paying the bills. Yeah. There was no prize money, right? No yeah. prize money, you know, until, until basically summer of 82. Um, so, you know, I, you know, I, I had told, told my boss, you know, where I was working, uh, you know, assistant manager of a marine recreation facility, I go, look, I have to get this out of my system, right? I, 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 I got third and 81, and I've got to go do it one more time, you know, with a little more thoughtfulness into my training, better equipment, mm -hmm. and, and, and then I'll be 100% focused on the job. You know, so I, I need a week's vacation, you know, to go to Kona. <laughs> it's like one week, seven days, right? Wow. And then I won the whole thing and I came back on like, oh, God. What now what am I? Do? Yeah. Right? <laughs> I'm totally conflicted. <laughs> I got this, this, you know, this occupational track, you know, I got a wife, you, you know, we don't have a family yet. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, and here's this carrot of professional triathlon thing. Right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be prize money this summer. There's going to be sponsorships. You guys are going to be, you know, just like NBA or NFL players. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, well, that, that would be nice, but I don't know about that. <laughs> and I was older, too. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I was, see, 82, I was already 25. So, like, you know, I'm not a spring chicken. You know, I'm not like 18 or 19. Yeah. And if there's going to be prize money and, and professional opportunities, man, that shit better happen quick. Yeah, Otherwise, really. you know, I'm down the road. Yeah. <laughs> So how did that, you made the decision then to become full-time triathlete? Like, how did you make that work? Or did you keep your job or? No, no, I didn't. Um, I mean, I always had another job. I mean, even, even for every year I was professional triathlete between 83 and 99, I always had additional jobs, other income sources um, that were just about, you know, the security of, of making money, but they were about, you know, trying to be a well-rounded person. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I went back and, you know, and, and, and worked at the Mission Bay Aquatic Center for another year and a half. And then I left that and became a, um, a marketing associate with a chain of athletic shoes, uh, shoe stores. And, and then, uh, gosh, what did I do after that? Then we started our little clothing company, Tinley Performance Wear. Yeah. In 84, so I did marketing and promotions for that company. And then I, I did a lot of work for my sponsors, you know, whether it was Saucony uh, or, or Power Bar or Anheuser-Busch or, I, I, you know, light speed bikes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was always sort of asking, hey, what, what can I do to, you know, to, to earn the fact that you're actually giving me like $2,500 a year? Yeah. <laughs> so, so you did a lot of sports marketing. You know, something, you it's funny, Seth. I, yeah, I, I just found out the other day. I had, I had no idea because I don't really follow triathlon. 
Um, somebody said that like, there's a whole bunch of professional triathletes that are making over a half million dollars a year. And I said, no way. I don't believe it. So I started asking around, did a little research, and it's true, right? Male and female. There's a bunch of people yeah. making pretty good money, right? Yeah. Good for them. Good for yeah. Them, so. so you don't follow it at all anymore? Not really. No. I couldn't tell you who won the Ironman last year. I think it was a a Danish a Danish or a Dutch guy. or I know there's, there's something happening in the Netherlands where there's Norwegian. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. it. They're, they're, Team Norway. The, yeah, the secret sauce. Yeah. yeah. They it's know so what funny. to do. Or, you know, it's, and it's all science-based. <laughs> they say it's all science-based. So, uh, yeah, cool. the, the Norwegians came in swinging. And I think now from talking with quite a few different pros and people in the industry, they're, they were the Norwegians were kind of hanging this stuff out like, oh, yeah, we're doing a lot of this lactate testing. And, you know, da, 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 and they're like paying for these 2 and $3 lactate strips and every – few minutes in their workouts they're pricking their ear and they're measuring this that and doing that but a lot of the pros have said like i think it's just all smoke and mirrors because some this guy over here or this guy over here they're not doing that they're just kind of keeping to the basics and they're performing just as well so it's been interesting to watch that grow but even since i've been involved in the sport which has literally only been maybe five or six years it seems to have grown so much um in the amount of media coverage and obviously like the sponsorships coming out to play with the PTO. I don't know if you know about them recently coming at bat to mm -hmm. make sure that it, you can make yeah. a living in this sport. Yeah. It's been, it's been pretty amazing to, to witness for sure, but it's just so neat to hear some of your stories about the pioneers. I mean, I'm, I'm going to clip up this episode and talk a little bit about the glass peanut butter jar that was <laughs> wired to the guy's bicycle. Cause I can't even imagine my the first ever half Ironman I did, I tried eating in a granola bar and I got so sick and cramped that I was like, I'd never eat solid food again. But it's yeah. just so wild that people did that. And something else too, um, just for my own entertainment to share, I was watching some of these old videos and a great percentage of these people that were doing the Ironmans, it literally looks like they are knocking on death's door by the end. And I can only assume it's because of yeah. just like the lack of nutrition i mean taking salt for instance or whatever like a lot of those pieces of education just weren't there so it's just so crazy to see how far it's come and just want to thank people like you for yeah. making it happen and helping it grow it's so cool yeah well nutrition is certainly a big part of it but i do think that people are smarter mm -hmm. about the preparation and what it takes to you know to, to go out and not just survive an Ironman distance event, but to race it. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are lots and lots of age groupers, you know, hundreds of thousands of these people around the world. Mm -hmm. And they have access to, to good information, good training programs, great coaching, great nutrition, you know, credible equipment compared to the, you know, the, the dinosaur crap that we had to ride and <laughs> run in. And, uh, and, and so good for them, you know, to access new technology. Yeah, I mean, look, it's been, you know, it's been 40 some years. So why shouldn't things have improved and have changed? Yeah. So I, I celebrate them. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm proud to have been a small part of those early years. And, and uh, you know, if the professional side of the sport, you know, is alive and healthy and blossoming and, and lots of people can, can do really, really well financially, um, you know, good for them. Yeah. Good for them. Yeah, that's really neat. So what was considered like a, a pro level of volume back in the 80s and 90s? You mentioned like just drilling yourself into the ground. Did that ever pull back or was there like a threshold that people were trying to get to? Well, I think some of my bigger weeks, uh, I would swim um, at least 20,000 yards. Yeah. Um, I, I, would, I would ride between 350 and 400 miles a week on the bike. Not very fast. <laughs> yeah. And, and my running miles that's was probably 65 to 80 miles. Wow. So you were doing so that's, heavy. You, know, you, you do the hours. That's that's 40 to 50 hours yeah. of training. And then, you, you know, you add on rest, you know, chiropractic adjustment, massage, stretching, mm -hmm. you know, all those kind of ancillary supportive modes that, you know, are necessary if you're going to ask your body to put in that kind of mileage. Yeah. Did you but do it, like, it became a, go ahead. I was just going to say, did you do like training blocks, like three or four weeks and then kind of a down week recovery type of a situation or take a day off once every seven or. 
I would never take a full day off, but, but yes, the, the whole idea of periodization became pretty self-evident, you know, sort of 83, 84, we yeah. were starting to figure things out. Yeah. You know, I, I was fortunate enough, you know, to, to have good training partners in San Diego and, and we would train together to support each other, but we would also talk a bit about, okay, so, you know, wh wh what's a perfect week look like? And, uh, you know, what are all the factors that go into providing enough rest, enough distance, enough speed, enough tempo, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and, and this whole concept of, of using things like blood lactate, you know, that seemed futuristic to us. Yeah. I mean, we were just happy to have a, you know, a watch with a stop, you know, with a, with a second hand and take our pulse and go, all right, I think yeah. I'm around 160, 170. Uh, mm -hmm. Is that high? Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> <laughs> so... So, so yes, we overtrained, but the self limitation came when you know a lot of us who had been doing it for a number of years, you know, we we simply ran into a cul de sac, you know, and we couldn't get out. And you know, Dave Scott, Mark Allen, Scott Molina, um, even Mike Pig, Ray Browning, um, uh, Greg Welch, you know, they they would all take a half a year or a year off, say, look, wow. I can't do it. You know, I, I need to let my body rest. And unfortunately, I never did that. So I, I, I just ran into the cul-de-sac. And by the time, you know, by the time I, I figured out, you know, I needed to go out and rest, um, and, you know, and had access to, to really good scientific data. Um, you know, I went to this exercise physiologist down at Baylor outside of Dallas. And Jim Strait Gunderson, great guy, super smart. And, uh, you know, we did these series of, of submaxes and max X tests on the treadmill on the ergometer, mm -hmm. you know, taking little blood lactates and watching my cortisol levels. And, you know, this was, you know, cutting edge stuff back in sure. you know, 89, 90. Mm -hmm. Finally came out with the dad and he says, he goes, you are so overtrained, right? It's it, it surprised that, you know, <laughs> that you're walking. And, and by the way, your testosterone is at female levels. So, you know, oh congratulations, goodness. you know, you're now a chick. That's what he said. <laughs> congratulations, you're a chick. <laughs> what? What does that mean? <laughs> so I go, what do I do, doc? He goes, I eh, should take a year off, right? And just go for hikes, go for a walk. I go, I'm gonna take a year off. You know, I'm like 35 years old. I can have one good year left. I can take a year off. Yeah. So I, th I, I think I, I cut back for about six weeks, felt great, and then just started hammering again. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Do you, do you struggle with any like heart issues now, like AFib or anything just from going hard so often? Man. Um, no. Um, I don't have it. I don't have any of the AFib stuff. I've never had the ablations. I'm very aware of it. I watch yeah. it. You know, my, my little brother has had those, you know, any number of friends, you know, Dave Scott, Greg mm -hmm. Welch, uh, other, you know, endurance athletes who, perhaps, you know, suffered, you know, through, you know, the, the long-term effects of what they call left ventricular hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so, yeah, so far, so good in that area. Good. Um, you know, health-wise, I'm okay. You know, I, I give myself like a, a solid B. Yeah. <laughs> you know, both, both hips resurfaced. I don't know why my knees still work. Wow. Um, I, you know, my low back hurts, but you know, anybody over 40 and you know, wake up in the morning, their low back hurts. So sure. we, we try not to complain. You know, my friends and I get together and someone starts in and they go, Oh yeah, this hurts, that hurts. And we're like, you know what? Everybody has something. Yeah. Just talk about the good stuff, right? Don't, yeah. don't start the day complaining about <laughs> this and that because we could all do that. And, and, oh, <laughs> and we sound like a bunch of old men, you know, yeah. in the retirement community. <laughs> We're all destined to go there someday, so that's all right. <laughs> I know. I said, "Come on, man! Look up. We're gonna do this. We're gonna go exercise today. This is gonna be great." Well, I don't know. You know, it's like my, I can't really see that well, and I got some skin <laughs> cancer. I'm kind of like, you know what? Shut up. Let's go. Yeah, yeah. Get with it. Oh man, how deep were the pro fields back there? Like you back then for those races, you threw out quite a few names um, that I recognized, but did they go pretty deep? Yeah. Um, you, you know, there was, there was a, a large contingency of what I might call the journeyman, 
you know, people who, who, who they're right on the edge of, of making it, uh, you know, like I said, you know, Ray Browning, Jimmy Riccatella, Paul Huddle, um, gosh, Kenny Glaw, you know, I mean, these guys would show up at Ironman and they'd get eight, 12, get no prize money, no recognition, barely, a, you know, a sponsor and they're working part-time jobs and, but they're right there just hoping that the sport, you know, w- would, would expand and grow and provide more professional opportunities. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, but quite honestly, there, there, there really weren't that many people who were winning big races. Yeah. You know, there was the big four and then there was, you know, again, you know, people who were right there. Um, and in the women's field, um, you know, it, it was perhaps a little bit more broad. Um, but I, again, you know, I, I, I think to your point, Seth, it, it wasn't that deep. You know, I mean, <laughs> there just weren't that many people who were willing to risk yeah, still young. what we were risking. Yeah. Yeah. Again, hats off to you guys, because without the, a lot of those people willing to risk it all, really, and literally, it, it wouldn't be where it is today. The more people showing up, talking to their friends about it, doing the races, eventual prize money coming in. I mean, yeah, it's just been pretty recently that people started actually making good money doing this type of a sport if you're pretty good. Even still, it's it's not easy yeah. if you're a professional to make it. I mean, there's a lot of groups trying to lift each other up. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's pretty right. it's a pretty cool thing. Um, so one area that I'd like to shift to a little bit um, has to do with quite a bit of what you wrote in one of your books about, I believe, Racing the Sunset, just this idea of any type of professional athlete transitioning from being a professional athlete, which typically ends like late 30s, mid 40s or something like that, into like a professional working life. I've heard story and story over after of Olympians going through life, going to the Olympics, getting their gold or not getting their gold and then trying to figure out how to transition into life. How did you make that transition? Was it hard for you? And what have you found in writing your book that maybe would be something of um, value that we could kind of put out there to provide to others to know how to identify? Yeah. Well, it's, it, it, it is a tough thing. And, and um, the the journey for me was not easy. Um, I was surprised at how I was affected, mm-hmm. you know, by leaving the sport. And, and it wasn't sudden, you know. I mean, I still had a little bit of sponsorship. I still had a little bit of gas in the tank. Um, but gosh, you know, let's see, ninety nine, my last Ironman, I was I was forty two, and you know, I was looking around, going, "All right, well, I've been, you know, been, I've been riding this gravy train for a while." <laughs> Even though I've been working part time doing other stuff, what else are you going to do? Or what do you want to do? Perhaps more importantly, yeah. And you know, I mean, a couple of kids, again, you know, marriage, and uh, I, I didn't want to do anything with the sport. You know, I, I didn't. I didn't want to be a coach. I didn't want to, um, you know, be a salesperson. I want to be a marketer. I didn't want to be an events guy. I was like, I want to do something different. So. Uh, you know, I, I told my wife, I go, look, you know, I, I'm going to go back to the crossroads, right? You know, so this is sort of, you know, mythological, you know, idea of going back and, and doing the deal with the devil and figuring out, okay, where were you, you know, back in 83 when you turned pro, hmm. right? And I said, you know, I was in graduate school and, you know, teaching sailing, you <laughs> know, and, and I just retired, you know, of, uh, after, you know, doing, doing the firefighter paramedic thing for a couple of years. So I told, I told my wife, Virginia, I go, look, I, I think I'm going to go back to school and, and then I'm going to start working on the beach again as a lifeguard. She just looked at me like, dude, you're 42. <laughs> you're not gonna, what kind of lifeguard are you going to be? And what, you're going to go back and like sit in one of those little wooden desks and raise your hand. I got this, you know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, but that's what I did. And, uh, you know, that started a whole nother journey, a whole nother, you know, I, I went down a whole different path and, uh, yeah, it was a ton of work. Um, but it's worked out really well. I, you know, I've got, I've been at the university for 18 years now, I've got a great gig. I'm still working on the beach in the summers. Um, no, it's, I made the right decisions, sure. but, but I, I feel bad for a lot of people who, you know, have sudden retirements, unexpected, un, you know, unannounced, 
deselected, injured, you know, for whatever reason. And, and like, man, what, what do I do next? Yeah. Particularly for the young guys, you know, and gals. You know, let, let's say you, you reach the very apex of your life at 19 or 20. You know, and, and, and you, you're, you're famous around the world and you're making a lot of money and people love you. And suddenly all that goes away. You know, and then you got to go back to like, you know, sophomore geometry. <laughs> That's tough. Yeah. It's tough for a lot of people. Yeah. It's a big shift. It, do you think yeah. that it's possible to lessen that blow when it comes time to that transition in any way? Because my thought is, is it possible to identify like personally, like if I became a professional triathlete, I'm let's say top 10 in the world that's a huge part of what I'm thinking about every day. I mean, it's who I am. It's what I identify as. It's who I see myself as. And I want to excel in that area. Is it possible, do you think, yeah. to to pull away from that in the moment and disassociate a little bit and be like, hey, like this is a part of who I am, but it's not who I am. I can go and be a teacher at San Diego University, or I can go and be a lifeguard on a beach somewhere. I can go and yeah. literally be a woodworker if I want to. Like, do you think that it's it's healthy to start beforehand to work on those things? Absolutely. Um, I, I think, you know, the issues of over-identifying in one particular role are dangerous. Um, but I think at some point it it, uh, it is necessary because, you know, if, if you go to the starting line of an event and part of you is thinking, Gosh, you know, I'm, I'm working on this desk. And as soon, as soon as I get home from this race, I've got to figure out how to get these drawers to slide well, you know, using your woodworking example, right? Th then you're taking a, a part of your concentration away from perhaps where it needs to be in the moment. And, and there's a right. lot of people who can't, you know, make that shift in, in the immediate moment. Um, and, you know, and there's pre-retirement counseling, you know, there's other factors that, would influence, you know, you know the, the the amount of emotional trauma that one might suffer sure. when exiting sport. Mm -hmm. Some of it has to do with, um, you know, your 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 health, your sport, your your success level, um, you, you know, your financial uh, status, uh, your gender, uh, your sexuality, your spirituality, I mean, all those kinds of factors you know, play, play into how you can either move seamlessly away from sport or you get stuck, hmm. you, know, you get stuck for a while and you don't know what to do. And I mean, there's you know, way too many examples of people making bad decisions, trying to figure out what's next after professional sports. Yeah, for sure. Easiest place to Open get up your a book. restaurant with your name on it. Yeah. What's that? Uh, go what you were going to say. I'll ask in a second. No, no. I mean, the whole idea of, of putting a restaurant, you know, with your name on it, you know, I mean, a la, a la Rocky Six. Right? Yeah. What does that do? Right? You're going to get people coming in and, you know, and, and you're going to regale the same stories over and over again. But you know nothing about running a restaurant. Yeah. And, you know, you throw a bunch of money at it and suddenly, you know, it fails after 18 months going like, well, I just, I, you know, that was a wasted business venture. You know? mm. Why didn't somebody knock me on the head and say, you don't know anything about running a restaurant, right? <laughs> if, if you're looking for other ways, you know, to, to recapture that glory, right? I mean, there's, there's lots of other deviant things that you can do besides throwing away your money. Oh, yeah. but what's worse? You know, drugs, alcohol, sexual abuse. I mean, you know. Like, like I said, people make poor decisions looking to sustain, you know, that, that drug of fame. Yeah. And that's yeah. tough, you know, because uh, hum humility is a very hard lesson to learn. Mm. For sure. Yeah. Some wise words there. To, if people want to read that book, um, Racing the Sunset, easiest place to find it on Amazon? Yeah, yeah, there's, uh, there's a few copies. Well, there's lots of copies floating around. Um, okay. It's out of print, but, you know, I mean, you can you can buy it used for five bucks. <laughs> okay. So I don't, know, the... I don't know who has the rights to it now. It's, it's sort of been banned around. Originally, it was published by Skyhorse Publishing okay. out of New York, and I don't know. It's been a few years, so. 
not a bad book. I mean, you know, I, I, I wrote a bunch of books, and most of them aren't that good. But that one's that one's pretty good. Yeah, I was going to ask one of the questions of all the books that you wrote. What is the favorite book you've written, and why? Well, I, I, I <laughs> when I thought it was going to be the great American novelist, um, um, I, I became very <laughs> interested in historical fiction, mm-hmm. and I, I had some pretty good publishing success with sample chapters um, on, on a book that, that chronicles. Um, an individual who comes back from the Vietnam War, wake spends of a lot past. of time in the South, kind of finding himself. Yeah, yeah. In the wake of our past is is the novel that it, it eventually became. Um, unfortunately, it's well, it's really long. It's over six hundred pages, wow. and it's very character driven. Um, and I never got a chance to promote it because the pandemic sort of you know uh, disabled you know my uh, my ability to go do readings and appearances and whatnot. But uh, I, I like it. I like, I like the book. You know, it, if, if you like the long form and you're willing to, you know, spend several weeks with a text or what you might call a summer read, <laughs> mm-hmm. um, I, I think it's a value. And, and you know, I'm, I, I, I guess I feel more proud of that book because of, you know, the, the amount of time it took me to write it, something like 10 years yeah yeah I, so, I, I in the I was wake actually, of our past also available on amazon or yeah yeah better booksellers near you yeah i'll um i'll link it in the show notes for anybody who wants to check it out and also on the youtube oh thank um, you Seth. that's nice, yeah for yeah. sure i mean we're not very big but happy to share it um but yeah it yeah. seemed really interesting from a when i was doing just a little background reading to kind of formulate some questions i came across that one wake of our past and like you're saying it focuses on this historical fiction of a person coming back from the Vietnam War. I thought it was an interesting topic for someone just coming from what I thought was just a purely triathlon background, but obviously you've had much more broad of experience, um, but that was neat and, and kind of shocking to see that kind of a book. So I look forward to checking it out. Yeah. Um, well, a lot of us, um, yeah, a lot of us were really affected by that war. And, you know, fortunately I, I dodged that bullet, um, you know, you know, they they ended the draft eighteen months before I would have been drafted, but they still mm. were giving draft numbers. You know, and my my draft number was thirteen. And I'm oh like, my. all right, well, gosh, so this shit still going on. You know, and by then a lot of people had come back and said, "Don't go." It's, you know, it's a total waste. And so, you know, I'm I'm in 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 my mind, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? You know, yeah, what do go you to do? Canada, try to be a conscientious objector. I don't. Mm. Know. And so it uh, it it. It played heavily on my generation's thought during those tumultuous years between, you know, 1966 and 1973. Yeah. Yeah, that's big, big to consider. Um, so I read that you like playing guitar. I do. What kind of guitar I mean, do you have? Do you play a little bit? Uh, well, you- I, I have more than I can play at once. But um, uh, I, I'm a big fan of Larravee and Taylor, and I oh gosh, you know, I mean, um, yeah. Like I said, I have I have more more than I can play at once. Um, okay, so you have multiple guitars then. But yeah, I have to, you know don't ask my wife how many I have. But <laughs> you know, a friend of mine has um, a few more than I do. And, uh, you know, I was at his house one time and <laughs> I think he had 21 guitars and I probably oh, only wow. have like, you know, 18. And wow. I go, dude, who needs 21 guitars? And he says, the guy who has 20. That's and, right. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. So I, I, I do know, play know, guitar. It's, it's a little bit of a, you know, it's a little bit of a, of a collector collectability you know i don't spend money on a lot of things i don't you know i don't have nice cars and, you know i have nice houses but i got a couple of nice guitars yeah <laughs> i do play guitar a little bit i am um, so i grew up playing on my buddy's um dad had a ton of different guitars he like had 12 strings and all kinds of guitars that i couldn't even name some of them were worth more than i ever thought you could even buy a car for it was crazy so i got to play around on them and grow up on on learning how to play uh now i have a little Taylor, it's just a Dreadnought series, but I, my favorite guitar is probably the the Martin D Dreadnought series. Um, 
that just makes him. I love that deep sound of the Martins. They're some of my yeah. favorite guitars yeah. to play. You can't beat it. You can't Real go movie. wrong with Martins. Yeah. Martin, yeah. What What's your favorite guitar that Anyways, you have? That I have right now. Uh, gosh, let's see. Um, I, I have a Martin Triple O One Five, right? And it's all maple, and it's you know, it's not expensive guitar. But it's solid. It's it's a solid wood guitar, mm -hmm. and I leave it out, and you know I've dropped it, and I take it to the beach, and people go, "Don't, don't bring that guitar to the beach." Right? <laughs> um, anyways, and I just I just play the heck out of that thing. Yeah. So, what kind of style my, my do you play mostly? I don't like to change strings. I don't like to change strings. I was like, it's way too much work. Really? I mean, you know, if I were to hit the lottery. Like I, 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 I'm going to hire a guitar tech to come over to my house every six weeks and, and change all the strings because, you know, we live at the beach and so everything rusts really quick. Yeah. Then you look at the strings and go like, God, this thing sounds horrible, right? Yeah. Do you <laughs> get the problems, right, Seth? <laughs> yeah, for sure. Do you use, um, like your strings, do you use like wax coated or the coated strings or use all actual yeah, steel? Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a coated, coated string. Um, I think it's a Delorio. It's, it's, it, it works pretty good. And it sounds not quite as good, but it, you get a lot more life out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I'll have to check out those then. Um, so just a couple more questions and I'll let you go. Cause we're running toward an hour here, but your, um, yeah. your children, Tori and Dan, are they into triathlon or what are they doing? Dane. Uh, Dane, no. sorry. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're both, um, uh, successful, uh, you know, business folks with kids um and you know and we have uh we have two grandkids with one more on the way so happy you know, man we are, we're we're gainfully employed as grandparents yeah which is hilarious good for you, good for you. how long have you fun. been married god in human or dog years <laughs> in human years <laughs> I get I get, I get seven years credit for as long as I've been married. There you go. We got married in eighty one. Wow. So I do the math. Right? Forty years. Uh, forty forty one, forty two, going on forty two. Wow. Forty two. Over forty two. Yeah. We need to have just a, a moment seven. of applause. That's two hundred yeah. that's two hundred and eight. <laughs> that's almost three hundred years. You try to be married for three hundred years. Yeah. Say, exactly. Oh God, how'd you do it? I don't know. Get lucky, I guess. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Was she like? Uh, how did you meet your wife? Was this like a high school sweetheart situation, or she uh, saw you she, running? She worked, she, we worked together. Um, we met in college, and we worked at the same place. You know, but but she was she was above my pay grade. You know, she was sort of mm -hmm. a promotions a PR gal, and I, you know, I started I started this place like you know cleaning boats and scrubbing the bottom of boats, and you know, being a dock master and worked my way up to sailing instructor and <laughs> so yeah you eventually uh, got her well that's awesome so do you have any uh marriage advice yeah uh, <laughs> choose well early right choose well take early. your time yeah i mean a lot you know some people go oh, i'm just gonna get married <laughs> I go why you know hmm. i go do you love her you know, or do you love him? <laughs> oh, of course. And I go, all right, well, but do you like him too? You know, mm. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm probably the last person to, to ask about that. But, um, you know, in California, the divorce rate's like, you know, 58%. So yeah, and climate. great majority of my friends, yeah, are on, you know, wife number two mm. or three. Sometimes it takes a while, you know, find the right one. And, and it's okay. You know, it's, I mean, divorce is not a bad thing. It's, it's not the stigma that it was in the fifties and the sixties. So. Hmm. Well, thank you for sharing. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. Sure. I don't know if that good advice or bad advice, but I think anyways, that, well, Hey, yeah. listen, good luck with the site, you know, and, and um, I'll, you'll have to send me some of your other links so I, so I can kind of check out, Sure. Yeah. But particularly the interview with Mike Parnell. So, so tell me how you know Mike. Oh, so crazy story. So um, my end of my sophomore year in college, um, 
it's encouraged if we want to as students to go basically serve a year in a foreign country, whether part of a medical mission or some kind of religious organization. And I decided to go to the Philippines. Well, Mike's son, um, Gray, happened to go to the same place that I went in the Philippines. And we met there, hit it off super well, um, became really good friends. And so that's how I met Mike. And when I came back to the United States, I actually started this small company called Sway with Gray as my partner. Um, it was, we were making insulated camping hammocks and Mike really? obviously with, yeah, with his experience, um, with Oakley sunglasses, obviously that's probably how you know him. And, um, the other ventures that he's done, he just a super sharp, pick yourself up by your bootstraps kind of a guy. And I told Mike about the idea and he yeah. gave a little bit of money to kind of chase after it. And one thing led to another and that business ended up growing and kind of going kaput over the uh, pandemic. But yeah, Mike is just been kind of one of those heroes, um, a mentor of mine who's yeah. been able to speak some life into my life and or some light into my life and yeah. keep me on a, a steady path. And he's, yeah, I mean, he's talk about above my pay grade. He's, he's a wealth of knowledge and experience and history and so many cool stories. So, yeah, that's how I know Mike. Yeah. Have you been out to see their place in Orcas Island? I have. I've been there a few, few times. Got to enjoy a... Um, yeah. A Thanksgiving with the family, got to see the fi- family dynamic and meet all of the kids. And yeah, he, he's in the yeah. golden years of his life. He's got the grandkids and, you know, everybody's kind of moved out. And Don's super sweet. I don't yeah. know if you remember Don, but she's super nice, his wife. Of course, of course, yeah. 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 Do you know them pretty well? Do you yeah, hang he's... out every once in a while? Um, I haven't seen them in years, but um, yeah, he invited us up uh, some years ago and, and, you know, we spent four or five days with them at their place. And, mm-hmm. uh, and of course I remember him, you know, from, from Oakley, huh. but just a really, you know, gracious, you know, stand up guy and yeah. his family. is also, I, I don't know the kids that well, cause they were, they were very young yeah. know, when we were there. Yeah. They're more my age. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, you know, we shared a sort of passion for vintage motorcycles and, and Hondaka uh, stuff. Oh yeah, he, he probably told you the whole doctor story. <laughs> I actually have seen it yeah. um, hanging in his garage. I think he has it out there, or one of them. Still, oh, that's yeah. great. Yeah, yeah, he's a cool guy. Well, I, yeah, I, I've lost contact. So if you think about it, um, you know, send send me send me um, a way I, I will. can you know just reach out and, and tell him tell him hello. So I will. I will send you his contact. You I'm sure he'd love to hear from you. Ask him about the time he hit the he hit the deer taking off uh, uh, from from the airport. And oh when my he goodness. landed, he hit a deer taking off. He was going to Orange County from Orcas, and he didn't know whether it had bent the, the uh, uh, you know, the landing gear. And so apparently, you know, when he, when he finally landed in Orange County Airport, all the fire trucks were out there, and the fire marshal. And yeah. fortunately, everything was fine. And, uh, you know, one of the fire marshal FAA types came out and said, well, you know, I, I, I'm glad that you made it okay, but I'm going to still have to fine you. What? And says, For what? Hunting deer out of season. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he hit a deer on the runway. He didn't even know if he killed it or not, but you know, they're just pulling, they're pulling fur out of the, out of the wheels. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I have to ask him that story. I haven't heard it. That's crazy. Anyway, that's a, that's a great Mike Parnell story. So yeah. you'll, have to, you'll have to ask him about that. I will for sure. Awesome. Well, Hey, thanks man so much for taking the time. Uh, I really appreciate it. It's been super yeah. fun. We'll have to stay in contact and I'll send you Mike's contact over for sure. Yeah. All yeah. right, Seth. Well, listen, good luck with everything. Yeah. I, I, I enjoyed the talk. Yeah. Thank you so much, man. All righty. We'll see you Uh, later. Have a great day. All right. You too, Scott. Bye. Once again, thank you so much for jumping into this episode with Scott Tenley. It was such a pleasure and awesome opportunity to get to know him and hear him some of his stories and just how the sport of triathlon has obviously changed over the many years and continues to evolve. Um, Just want to say a special thank you to Scott. Please check out the show notes and go and check out his books. Um, And um, yeah, I hope you guys have an awesome day. All right. See ya.